All right, Aaron Marino, welcome to the show. You've got an interesting uh, career. You are a style consultant, own some grooming products. You are a popular YouTube men's lifestyle guy. I mean, you have like 1.75 million YouTube subscribers, uh, two-time Shark Tank contestant. Um, so my question is like, what's your story? How did you get to this point where you were creating these, you know, sometimes zany videos on YouTube showing guys how to look and feel better about themselves? Zany is a good word, Brett. Yeah. Uh, well, it see, it all sort of started when I was when I was young. Um, you know, there are sort of a few different facets to my life that I really can identify as pivotal moments in how I got to where I am. One of which is I grew up fairly poor. We didn't have a lot of money. And this is, you know, the time of your life where you're really focused and, and fixated on fitting in. And so one of the things that I learned to do very early on was stretch a dollar. All my clothes came from a thrift store. And so it forced me to get very creative with shopping and style and looking outside of the box. And so this was something that sort of I still to this day really enjoy doing is going to thrift stores and looking around, even though financially I can afford, you know, not to go to thrift stores. It's still sort of in my DNA. Um, combine that with my love of fitness, which sort of started at the age of, I would say, 13. Um, I had uh, two stepfathers that weren't exactly the greatest, uh, but my mother was incredibly supportive and and one of the gifts that she gave me is the, sing the gift that I feel changed my life more than anything, which was a fitness membership. No matter how bad my home life was or how upset I was at home, when I went to that gym, I felt incredible. I felt like a king. And it's where I really felt like my confidence was, was, was developed. And for those listeners out there that, that exercise and take care of themselves physically, you know how dramatically it impacts everything else in your life. When you feel good about yourself, that's really ultimately what, what, what pushes you forward in in many different ways and many different areas of your life. And so at the age of 13, I knew what I wanted to do for the rest of my life, which was own a fitness center. And so everything I did up, into, up through graduating college was geared towards owning a fitness center. It was the only dream I had from the age of 13. Um, my senior project when I was at West Virginia University was I started a fitness center. And, you know, I was so excited. I moved to Atlanta. I, I knew that I didn't want to stay in Philadelphia. All my friends were selling cars and, and I knew that I was, I was destined for fitness greatness. And so I moved to Atlanta. I met a guy. I was working at the time as a personal trainer at a fitness center at a Bally's. I met a guy. He said, hey, I want to open a nutrition store. I got a guy who's willing to give me $40,000. Are you in? I said, absolutely. It wasn't a fitness center, but it was a business. And I really feel that at, the, at my core, I'm an entrepreneur. I love business. And so it was my first opportunity. And uh, went there. It was great. We expanded to two locations within the year, but um, we ulti or I ultimately decided that it wasn't something I wanted to stay with long term because the gentleman that I was, I was in business with was actually selling drugs out of the back. And um, I, I knew that I'd be popular in prison, but I would not <laughs> thrive in prison. And so I decided to leave. And that was a very difficult decision. Um, and I ultimately ended up going back to personal training at a fitness center. Well, during the time that I was at the nutrition store, I met a woman and helped her lose 100 pounds. Um, she came to me one day when I was at the fitness center and said, hey, I didn't tell you this, but I actually got certified as a personal trainer sort of behind your back, and I want to open a fitness center. The woman was older. She was established. She was a technical writer named Linda, and she now had this new found passion and wanted to help other people like I helped her. And so um, we signed the lease to our location to open a personal training studio on September 11th, as in the September 11th. And that should have been an omen as to how our business was going to unfold. But we, um, we, we tried making making it work. We, we thought we were going to expand and, and create this, this line of fitness centers for parents and children and, and all sorts of great things. We raised money. There were all sorts of legal issues between one of our business partners and my partner, Linda. 
And um, ultimately, we ended up having to shut down the business. But something interesting happened when we were there. I met a guy who was one of my clients who was getting ready for a date. And he's like, hey, I don't know what to wear. What, what should I do? And I said, well, why don't I just come over to your place and we'll take a look at what you have, see what you need, go shopping. By the way, your nose hairs are crazy. We got to take care of that. And a week later, his coworker called me and said, hey, I love what you did with Steve. Can you take my husband shopping? I said, absolutely. It was a lot of fun. And then she asked me that, that, that question where it was sort of that light bulb moment. She said, well, how much do you charge? And it's like, wait a second, maybe there's a market for this. At the time, my fitness center was exploding. I had to file bankruptcy. I didn't have a plan B, though. Um, as an entrepreneur and as, as sort of just the way that I am, I never have a plan B. I'm so focused on plan A that I never stop to think, well, what if this doesn't work out? That it's never an option for me. And so at the time that I had to file bankruptcy, I, I was um, driving a beer cart on weekends just so that I could eat and uh, put, put gas in my car. Uh, but that was the point at which I had to decide, well, okay, what's next? And I had done a few of these little mini makeovers on these people. And I thought, you know, maybe there's a market. This was back in 2006. And so I did a little bit of looking online and really found that there were zero resources for regular average guys like me, my dad, my friends, just to get basic, solid style advice. And so, sure, there was GQ Magazine and Esquire, but this wasn't my reality and this wasn't the reality of most of the guys I knew. And so I decided to start an image consulting business and cater exclusively to regular guys. Um, 2008, got a video camera. Long story shorter, um, the rest is kind of history. Right. You created the, I am, it's I am Alpha M. Yeah. The YouTube channel is uh, Alpha M. Alpha and, M. Yeah. And the website is I am Alpha M. Dot com. So yeah, so you you've basically taken this this style of consulting business and you brought it online to millions of of men across the country and across the world. Um, so let's talk about style because uh, I think it's it's something that just it boggles the mind of a lot of average guys. They just like I don't know what to wear or like what things go together. Um, so let's start big picture first. What's your overall approach or philosophy to style? In terms of style, you really just need to find what works for you. And when I say what works, it's sort of, it sounds so simple, but it, it's what, what you feel good in, what makes you feel sexy. Um, and I know that, you know, what, what do you hear? Most regular guys hear the term sexy. It's like, well, wait a second, that's for women. Well, it is, but you can still feel great about yourself. Um, you know, you'd never want to push your boundaries too far to where you feel uncomfortable, but when you get dressed, you should dress with purpose. And everything you put on, you should feel great wearing. It should fit you flawlessly, as flawlessly as you know, you can find or as you can have tailored without being overly tight, but you really need to feel comfortable and own what you're wearing. Gotcha. And so, I mean, like what, that raises an interesting question that the guys sort of that rejection or that knee jerk reaction is like, ah, oh, I don't want to, why should I care? Like, why should I care how I look? Right. Yeah. So why should men care about how they look? Because it has never been more competitive out there in terms of professional, professionally, it's never been more competitive personally, relationships. If your competition is paying attention, you can't afford not to. And it doesn't take that long to pay attention to the clothing that you're wearing. Just making sure that it fits you well, that it's not worn out, that it doesn't have stains, that it's ironed, that it's pressed. It's about personal packaging. You know, everything has a brand. And we as, as individuals, we have a brand. And your image, your style, that's sort of letting the world know who you are and how you feel about yourself. And if you're presenting a confident, successful package, then the world is going to see that. And as a result, you're going to be rewarded both professionally and, and personally. All right. So you, you've, you're kind of your bread and butter, are these makeovers you've um, done, you know, you do that one-on-one -on -one with people, but you also do these makeovers where you film them, where you take just regular dudes. And I've watched these. Yeah. They're like, they're regular dudes. Like they're guys who just, mm -hmm. they're working IT jobs. They just, they look like a normal Joe. And then you do these makeovers. Um, can you share a story or two of some of the men you've worked with on how upgrading their personal style just, just totally transformed and improved all facets of their life? You know, it really boils down to confidence. And that's the big takeaway. It's 
I've worked with so many, hundreds, thousands of guys. They're all pretty much doing the same thing wrong. Um, and they, they don't really have a firm grasp on what works for them, what doesn't work for them. But it is amazing to see the transformation in their eyes and in their confidence, in their body language, when all of a sudden at the end of a makeover, you turn them around, you let them see themselves in the mirror, and they finally, for the first time, feel incredible about themselves and the way that they actually are projecting and presenting themselves. Um, in terms of one or two, there are so many. It's, it's men, when you feel better about yourself, when you like the person you see looking back at yourself in the mirror, everything gets better. You're, 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 you're a better boss. You're a better husband. You're a better father. You are friendlier. You make eye contact more. You engage more. But it all boils down to feeling good about yourself. And so I joke with people that it's actually confidence that we're, we're changing from the outside in. But sometimes if that's all it takes, then, then you know, go with what works. But um, I don't know if that answers your question. But. No, yeah. That, that, I mean, what I love about it, because like I used to be, like when I was in college and I had a lot of free time, I'd watch with my wife what not to wear yeah. on TLC. And I was like, I enjoyed it. I mean, it's primarily women, but for some reason I enjoyed it because it was always great to see the story, like see how these people's lives got better once they did that final makeover. And I was like, man, I wish there was something like this for dudes. And lo and behold, there you go. You've got it. And I mean, that's the thing. It's just like that. Yeah. I think what's happening is you're revealing, like they also they talk about on what not to wear, like you're revealing like the actual self, like your best you that's inside of you whenever you start dressing the way you should. I love that. I think I'm going to steal that. Was that that? Was that Clinton and Stacy? I think it was Clinton and Stacy. <laughs> I think it was Clinton and Stacy that, that you should steal it. I don't think they have, they have a trademark on it. So, okay. You mentioned uh, you, with these makeovers, you've seen um, sort of the same mistakes that guys make. Um, you mentioned that uh, it's just like not knowing what works for them. But what are some of the other more common style or personal presentation mistakes that you see men make? A lot of men, pretty much, when I work with somebody, they're, they're a few things that right away you can change that make a dramatic difference in the way that you actually look. And that is wearing clothes that fit you better. Now, everybody hears that and it's like, oh, well, of course, I'm going to wear clothes that fit. Nah, guys are a little bit hesitant. They hear fitted and they think tight. If you simply go from a regular fit shirt that is cut square like a box and you put somebody in something that is a little bit more tailored or tapered or contoured to the body, all of a sudden, they look three inches taller and 20 pounds lighter. The same thing goes for pants. Regular rise, regular width pants are something that you can modify that automatically makes somebody look taller, their chest wider, their shoulders broader. They look incredible by simply changing the cut of the shirt and the pants that they're wearing. And this goes for their, their business casual clothing. This goes for their casual clothing, jeans, shorts, shirts, t-shirts, everything you can modify and enhance somebody's look immediately. Right. I love that because I think a lot of guys, you're right. They, they, either, they just, they don't know they can modify their clothing. They think, okay, I buy, on, buy it off the rack. That's how I got to take it. That's how it's presented to me. I got to wear it like that. Um, but they also don't, uh, where's I going to go? They don't realize that um, you can change these things. Absolutely. And that's the other thing is, is you've got guys that have a wardrobe, a lot of professional, successful men. I go into their wardrobe and they've got you know, thousands of dollars worth of incredible clothes, but all they need to do instead of throwing out everything is take the key items that you love and have them modified or altered. Take the shirts to the tailor. They'll put a few darts in it. They'll contour it a little bit better. And all of a sudden you've got an amazing new wardrobe that fits you flawlessly. Um, they can do that with pants. They can do that with pretty much anything. Right. And I think a lot of too, a lot of men prefer the baggier yeah. stuff because they feel like it's hiding, you know, maybe that the belly they might have, but actually it just accentuates it in a weird way. Absolutely. No, a lot of men confuse comfort with roomy. And they also think that by wearing larger clothes, it's going to make them look smaller when in reality, it does the polar opposite. It makes them look heavier. It makes them look sloppy and dumpy when all they need to do is wear clothes that are tailored a bit more to their body. And that's the other thing, Brett, is that shirts, guys that have a belly or that are, you know, have a little bit of extra, you know, going on, they think that they need to wear bigger in order to camouflage and hide. And they are still 
they still should be wearing tailored clothing and wearing clothes that are, that are fitted as opposed to just, just regular and, and uh, big and baggy. Right. And so it just goes to my next question, like easy upgrades. This is an incredibly easy upgrade. All you got to do is just take your shirts, find a tailor. There's tons of them probably in your city. Play dry cleaners. Uh, I mean, dry cleaners, right. your mother. I mean, there are a lot of people, your wife. I mean, if somebody knows how to use a sewing machine, you can pretty much modify a shirt right at the sides and nobody can tell. Uh, but yeah, I mean, find somebody that can do it. Now, on some of the more complex garments, pants, jackets, those are ones that you're probably not going to just take to your dry cleaner who, who says, yeah, I can do that. But a straight hem on a pan, if you want to make that pan a little bit shorter, you know, no problem. But the more complex, I would try and look for somebody who is a little bit more of a tailor or, well, or more well-versed in the art of clothing construction. Right. And it's not very expensive either. I mean, you're no, like no, five, not, 10 bucks. That's it. That's it. And, and the look, oh my goodness, Brett, I'm telling you, it's like, it brings tears to my eye when I, when I see these guys and all, not like really, but it's so incredible. Just simple little modifications, like having your shirt tailored makes all the difference in the world and the way that somebody looks. Right. So yeah, I buy most of my dress shirts from JCPenney's, like the, the Stafford Oxford shirt. But like yeah. the thing I do is I go find a tailor right away and have them tailor. And it just a million times better. I mean, it looks like a, like a custom shirt that you spent, you know, hundred, two hundred dollars on, even though it's a $36 JCPenney shirt. That's it. And, and I, I say this time and time again, you t- give me somebody give me a $20 shirt and have it tailored that fits somebody incredibly versus somebody who spent $200 on a shirt. The guy who spent 20 looks better 90, a hundred percent of the time, as opposed to somebody who's wearing something that is ill-fitting. All right. So that's an easy style upgrade. What's another upgrade that guys can make that have, you know, an immediate high ROI? Jeans. Invest in a great pair of jeans, dark wash denim. It doesn't get any better than that. And it's probably the most versatile pair of pants that you own. You can dress them up. You can dress them down. You can throw a sport coat and a button down shirt on, a sweater vest, but you can throw on a a simple plain pocket tee and look incredible. A pair of boots. Oh my goodness. It's perfect. It's like James Dean. And um, it's, uh, it's such a simple, simple thing. But yeah, finding a great pair of jeans, that is super high ROI. Right. Yeah. I, I love, I got a great pair of jeans that I wear. It's dark denim. Yeah, you're right. I wear it all the time. T-shirts, when I'm picking up the kids with yep. boots. And what about what the, the boots too? Right. Yeah. You got to yeah. do it. But then you can wear, like I've gone to, you know, a nice steakhouse uh, when I've, you know, entertained clients here, I just throw on a white shirt and a sport coat and I look fantastic. Exactly. Incredibly versatile, timeless. It's always going to be in style. And that's the other thing, Brett, is that, you know, you really need to invest in clothing that is going to be stylish now as well as in five years from now. Talk about ROI. I see guys that buy trendy items or things that are very just now. And I, I think to myself, oh my goodness, that's just money wasted because next year you're not going to be able to wear that. And so a, a key takeaway to the listeners out there is invest in timeless styles. Don't go crazy with nuts patterns. Stick to the basics. Build your wardrobe from there. That should be your foundation. Now, if you want to experiment, step a little bit outside of your box and invest in a few other things and go with some of the more trendy items, that's fine. Do that. But just know that it's probably going to be out of style in a year. And so invest in the in the classics and you'll never go wrong. Well, I think that raises a great point because I think a lot of guys in particular are leery of style because I think, oh, geez, it's going to be so expensive. I have to buy stuff all the time. But you don't. If you just buy a few good pieces, it's going to last you three, four, five, sometimes 10 years. And so like that, you know, $200, you know, shirt around, I, I wouldn't spend time that, you know, $400 <laughs> suit you bought yeah. that looks great. I mean, by the time, you know, five years later, it's been like pennies a day, like that cost per use that. It, no, absolutely. Done. And that's, that's one of the, the ways that I justify purchases, um, like a leather jacket. You know, I, I had this, this, I, I went to buy a new leather jacket two years ago and it was a little bit more expensive than my budget. And when I really sat down and did the math, I can wear this jacket because it's, a, it's just a brown, you know, motorcycle-inspired jacket, small little collar. It's nothing outlandish or crazy with a lot of zippers or anything. I can wear it now almost every day throughout the winter, spring, and fall. 
I can wear it for 10 years. It's going to look better in 10 years because it's broken in. When you break it down to a per cost wear, it's, it's, it's pennies, as opposed to that one item, that one jacket that you buy that you only wear six times, that even it may be you know a third of the cost, but it's much more expensive when you actually calculate and do the math that way. All right. So Aaron, we've talked about some of the wardrobe essentials. You think a guy, a guy could have a pair of dark washed jeans is one of them. Any other wardrobe essentials that sort of build the foundation of a, of a man's wardrobe? Sure. I think that um, investing in a great pair of brown slip-on loafers is is a great option. Something that is dressy that you can wear with jeans, but you also could wear with um, with a suit. A great pair of boots. You know, boots are one of those things that that make a guy feel good. When you put on a great pair of boots, you just stand a little bit taller. It gives you a little bit of height. I'm a short guy, and so every inch absolutely helps. Um, you know, some other things is a great navy suit. You know, nothing with peak lapels, just your standard notched lapel navy suit. You can wear it to weddings, you can wear it to funerals, you can wear it to interviews, you can wear it to business meetings. Um, your tailored white dress shirt, another staple. Um, I also would say, hey, if you're going to get a white dress shirt, get a, a, a light blue dress shirt as well. It, it's a little bit more color, it's a little bit more playful, but it's still professional and you can wear it with a pair of jeans by itself, roll those sleeves up, you look great. Um, and I would say a leather jacket. I am a big fan of leather jackets, just kind of, they're sort of the, the perfect counterbalance to a great pair of boots where they just make you feel good when you're wearing it. And, and women find it attractive. Women and so do that's a bonus as well. Find it attractive. Steve McQueen. There it is. So here's a question. We've had people on the podcast and we've written a lot about sort of formal style. Like I think, you know, this people got that down. Like, okay, I need a suit that fits well. I a dress shirt that, that fits well, it's iron or whatever. But like, I think the lo- thing a lot of guys have trouble with is like how to look good in a casual setting, whether it's at the sure. office. Cause like, there's so many, like your options just explode for casual yeah. wear, right? With, with a suit, like, it's just like a, you wear a suit and dress shirt and a tie. That's, you know, yeah. that's it. You don't have yeah. many choices. So how can a man dress sharp in a casual setting when they have so many choices to, to choose from? You know, it, it, it does boil down to, you know, make sure that the pants that you're wearing fit. You know, all pleated, ca- all khaki pants were not created equal. It really boils down to you selecting better fitting, better styled items. I would say that invest in a few great pairs of chinos. Um, you know, one of, one of my favorite pairs of pants is a gray pair of chinos. They're incredibly versatile. You can dress it up with a, a button down or throw on a great, you know, lightweight V-neck sweater or crew neck sweater, um, wear, wear some, a sport coat with it, wear it with a pair of loafers or a pair of boots. It, it's incredibly versatile. Um, you know, pay attention to the details, layer sweater vests or I, I still think sweater vests are really cool. Um, and it's a great way to just add another level of, of depth and dimension to an outfit. Um, you know, a lot of guys are just doing the basic slacks with a button down shirt and that's it. Throw a sweater vest on top of it. Or if you want to, a lightweight V-neck sweater is a great option. Um, just to, like I said, add that next level of dimension to an outfit, but then pay attention to the details, the belt, the socks, the shoes, your watch, all these little details that make a big difference when you collectively put them together. Um, you know, and, and it really is going to determine, be determined by the corporate culture that you're, you're immersed in and what is acceptable and what's not. Um, if you're wearing, say, polo shirts, if polo shirts are acceptable for business casual, you can put away those peaked cotton polo shirts and invest in something that has a little bit nicer fabric, maybe a, a nice microfiber, um, you know, Banana Republic, Ministry of Supply. There are a lot of great polos that are a little bit dressier. They're going to hold their shape a little bit better than some of the standard quote unquote polo shirts or, or cotton polos you're going to get at Old Navy or The Gap. Gotcha. So um, that's, that's an interesting question. We can go there. Like, are there places or stores that are your go-tos that you can go there and you'll always find something that will look great? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, as, as men, we don't have 
the 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 quantity and the options that that our our female counterparts do. You know, when you go into a shoe store like a DSW, look at the men's section, look at the women's section. The men get like a row, the women get 37 rows. Right. Um, for men, they're really only a few options in terms of stylish clothes. Um, and, and from the casual department, you're looking at, you know, the Gap, J. Crew, you know, Banana Republic, that's sort of the, 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 you know, more expensive version of the Gap. But you know that if you're going to these places, that the clothing is going to be stylish and it's not going to be too over the top or outlandish. Um, some of the boutique stores and some department stores will have sections that are a little bit outside of the, the box. But I know that if I'm looking for a great outfit that's going to be nice quality, the fabric's going to be good, and the fit is going to be more on the tailored side as opposed to the bigger, baggier side, I like the Banana Republic. Um, but the downside to Banana Republic is it is a little bit pricey uh, compared to sort of its... its you know, more casual counterpart, The Gap. But I am a big fan of The Gap for casual clothes. Um, but department stores, you mentioned J.C. Penney earlier. Great option. Macy's, incredible. There are a lot of department stores that I absolutely love because you can find different styles and different price points within one store. And so Macy's is probably my one go-to store just because it, it does have different levels and you can find something for everybody. Gotcha. So no Aeropostale. <laughs> Not at this age, sir. Not, Not at this, this age. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> Aeropostale. Okay. Yeah. That Abercrombie, there are a lot of... The, the general rule of thumb is when you walk in, if everybody there could be your child, then <laughs> probably are in the wrong store for your demographic. Right. Yeah. Well, I, one that I forgot about, I was, for some reason I remembered it, was American Eagle. Remember American Eagle? Yeah. American... See, and here's the thing. American Eagle is... is Still, like you can find some some good stuff, even that would be age appropriate for guys in in their late twenties, thirties, forties. You know, as long as you don't have big logos, you can find some some decent standards. And um, that actually, American Eagle has some good good prices on just regular denim, and you can find items, but you have to know what you're looking. Got to know what you're looking for. All right, so let's uh, talk style for like uh, specific body types. You mentioned you're a shorter guy. Hmm. Um, any advice for, on sharp dressing for, for shorter men out there? Absolutely. You need to make sure that you are wearing clothes. I mean, fit is even more important on a short guy than, than anyone else, just because it does make such a difference. Um, the mid-rise pant is going to be much better than a standard rise, um, just because you want to accentuate and elongate your legs. And another way that you do that is make sure that the leg, the pant leg isn't too wide. Um, shoes. You want shoes that have a little bit more of an elongated toe box as opposed to something that is a little bit rounder and bulky, sort of like you think Doc Martens. All right. Um, shoes also have a visual, can give the visual illusion of somebody being a little bit taller than they are. Um, shirts also fitted. Um, monochromatic is good. Um, for short guys, you know, they're, you really can't go wrong with, with, you know, vertical stripes. You don't want patterns that are too big just because it's going to make you look disproportionately small if your pattern is really big. Stick with tighter patterns like small checks, you know, small window pane. There, there are definitely some smaller, tighter patterns that you should be gravitating towards. Gotcha. And like, I've, I've seen this in action, guys. I've seen Aaron in person. Didn't even really notice the height issue. Like, he was super confident, looked great, and it was awesome. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. And that's one of the – I get asked a lot about being short and about height. And, and a lot of guys are super self-conscious. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, they, they, they treat it like it's this, like, devastating handicap. And um, there's a good friend of mine, Brock, who owns a, a men's style blog called The Modest Man. He caters exclusively to men of modest height or under five foot eight. And I was on a podcast with him and, and Tanner Guzzi, who is another great podcaster who, and uh, vlogger that does masculine style. And uh, Brock said that um, Tanner was asking us about being short in style. And uh, Brock said, well, Aaron, nobody's told him that he's short yet. And it, 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 it made me laugh, but it was a very incredible compliment, honestly, because 
you know, being short is just, it's, it's like having brown hair. It's like having brown eyes. Are you going to miss out on opportunities? Of course. Is it because of your, sh- your short? Well, if you're trying to date a six foot two Amazon, you know, it could potentially, you know, affect that. But men need to really just focus on their, all of the amazing things that they are as opposed to what they're not. They're not six feet tall. It's okay. You just need to basically be as confident as you possibly can, dress to look tall, and just don't let that be an excuse. Right. Well, so uh, on the flip side, um, another thing that a lot of men are self-conscious about is their weight. So, you know, guys who are larger, um, style tips for them. Yeah, dark clothes, monochromatic looks. Um, you know, it, depending on what's larger. Some guys will have, and most most typically, are going to have a larger midsection. And so what I would recommend in order to balance, I would go dark on the top and then a little bit lighter color on, on the bottom. Uh, the dark is going to make you look smaller. The, the lighter, like a light tan, a light gray, is going to make your, ba- your lower half appear a little bit larger, but it's going to offset the, the upper body. Um, you know, once again, not super big, bold colors, not super big, bold patterns. You want to make sure that it's, it's subtle and subdued. Um, you know, fit once again is going to be, is going to be king. If you are wearing big baggy pants and you're a bigger dude, you're going to look bigger, heavier, shorter, and dumpier than you actually are. So it does boil down to fit as well, but dark colors, Clothing that's fitted, small patterns. Okay, great advice there. So let's move away from clothes. Let's talk about grooming because this is something um, you've done a lot of content about. And in fact, you own two men's grooming companies. You have Pete and Pedro, the the hair product company. And then uh, what's the new the name of your new skincare product? Yeah, it's uh, it's called Tej Hanley. Tej Hanley. Yeah. Well, let's talk about grooming. So, I mean, where do most men skimp on their grooming routine that they should be spending more time on? You know, it, it's funny, right? Because well-groomed is so all over the board. What well-groomed means to me is not what it means to my father. Um, you know, but but the one thing that a lot of guys don't pay attention to is is the <laughs> is is neck hair and chest hair coming out of their shirt. Um, and I'm not saying that you should remove your chest hair. I'm not saying that you should you know remove your back hair if that's your thing. But you know, make sure that you take a little bit of the length down if it is curling outside of your shirt. Um, another thing is is ear hair and nose hair. It blows my mind that with all of the all of the jokes, all of the the information that is out there, um, that guys still it's like, hey, if I don't lo- see it looking directly in the mirror, then it's not there. Um, and if I had a dollar for every for every guy who had super long ear hair. I would uh, I would be a rich man. Those are those are two areas, ear and nose hair, that that guys really kind of skimp on. Well, and um, eyebrows are another thing. You don't need to shape them like a woman, but as we age, the hair on our eyebrows starts to get exponentially longer. And so, just trimming them up um, when you go in to get a haircut, if you are going to a, bar- a a good barber or a good stylist, they should take a look around and and help you out and trim those those crazy strays as well. Right. I can attest to the nose hair and ear hair thing. <laughs> I, it's be, like I've suddenly like it's in my consciousness now. My wife, because I never like I've, I've checked that. And I've never had a problem because I was younger. But now I'm in my mid thirties. Like they're starting to peek out like a grandpa. It's, <laughs> Absolutely. it's insane. My wife's like, you need to get an ear and nose trimmer. And so like, I've had to buy one on Amazon and yeah, yeah. it makes a world of difference. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I, on the chest hair, man, I, I like the Tom Selleck look. I, no, I, no, no, I, Tom Selleck, no, I'm saying no. Here's the thing. You're no chest hair is fantastic. It's amazing. It's just when it peeks out of a crew neck shirt oh, and it okay. comes out. That's what I'm talking about. Um, no, chest hair, go for it. All right. Everybody who's listening to this, I think absolutely. <laughs> You've got the audience, Brett. Right. Guys that come to me, a lot of them are, are, uh, are younger guys that are still trying to be Abercrombie models. <laughs> <laughs> so, I've given up on that. Exactly. I'm exactly. done. I think another thing that a lot of guys skimp on is uh, nails. Oh yeah. Yeah. Feet. Feet especially. Feet. Feet. Oh my goodness. Yes. If I, Oh Lord, there's nothing that is more repulsive than looking down at a guy wearing flip flops or sandals and the nails are 
incredibly overgrown or discolored. I and mean, your nail, you need to take care of those feet. I'm not saying to go get a pedicure, but pay attention. Right. When you trim your fingernails, trim your toenails. And I'll tell you too, like uh, women don't like to have a, a man claw foot <laughs> scrape them in the middle of the night. I remember when I got married, my wife was like, good night. Like she's like, you scratched me with your hideous big toenail. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I got to pay attention to this stuff now. Um, any other place? I mean, like skincare. I think that's a lot of like guys. I don't even like don't really think about that. But you got yeah. the skincare product. But I mean, yeah. why should guys care about their skin? Yeah, because it once again it it boils down to wanting to age gracefully. And there's nothing wrong with wanting to look good. There's nothing wrong with wanting to age well. Um, you know, the sun is incredibly hard on our skin. Um, it's why I wear sunglasses outside. It's why I put an SPF moisturizer. Um, you know, I've had loved ones that have had skin cancer. It, you need to take care of your skin. Um, you know, drink plenty of water. It's, it goes beyond just applying eye cream. It's just about using a moisturizer, cleaning your face, you know, once or twice a day to remove those, that, that dead skin, exfoliate, um, the, 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 the grime, the grit, you want to make sure that you're bringing that new, fresh, healthy skin up to the surface and reducing the amount of blackheads and blemishes due to excess oil and all the nastiness that builds up. It's just about, you know, looking good and, and feeling great. And so, um, I don't know if that answers no, the answers. question. And like, the thing is, you don't have to be fastidious about this, right? No. I think a lot no, of guys feel like they avoid it because like, ah, oh, it's just like, I gotta be like, girly about this, but you don't have to. No, absolutely not. There are many products out there that, that have a nice masculine odor scent. There are grooming companies and that sell skincare exclusively for men. Um, and it's something where I think our grandfathers might not have done it, but I think using just a daily moisturizer is becoming a bit more, it's becoming a bit more mainstream. And, um, you know, it, it's it's definitely something that a lot of a lot more men are are being more conscious and diligent about. Can you do not? All right. So uh, let's let's shift gears. We talked about personal presentation as far as grooming and style. Um, I'd like to get your insights in this because you, I think, have some really great insights. You are a two time Shark Tank contestant, and this is one of the most intense pitches a person can ever make you're in front of it you know, doesn't get any worse <laughs> you're in front of mark cuban you're in front of uh what's his name mr wonderful you know damon williams what else name with damon sean what all, whatever and then like close. you're <laughs> close yeah i got it i messed it up he's gonna if he, if he listens to this he's gonna bamboozle me but um he doesn't listen to it i know that um but then like it's on front of a million you know millions of people watching on this on tv so it's super intense how do you prepare for a pitch like that Oh man, you, I, and I joke with people by the time I actually walk out of those doors. And the one thing that Shark Tank is such a great show. People think that there are cuts and takes. There's not. If you screw up, you screw up, they leave it in and you keep going. There is no cutting when you actually go out there and pitch. The other issue is that you're out there for much longer than you see. Um, the second time I was out there for an hour and a half and they cut it to like 12 minutes. But I joke with people that by the time I go out there, I've been in that room 6,000 times. And it really comes down to, for me, I'm a big fan of visualization and practice. Um, I could I could recite my pitch in my sleep backwards in Latin. I practiced and practiced. And what I would actually do is um, I would try and get myself nervous when I would practice. I would get myself so amped up and just put myself in there as 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 much as I could that. I would sort of try to simulate or duplicate the anxiety that would come along with actually doing that. Um, you know, the one thing that I, I wanted to make sure is that I could just recite it, that it was almost like the alphabet. I didn't have to think about it because I knew that I was going to be dealing with a lot of other things. Um, funny story, the first time I go out and I'm getting ready, and when you, when you go out there to pitch to make it even more just intense... When you walk out, there's a little X on that oriental carpet, and they say, okay, you're going to walk out and you're going to stand there, and then you're going to stare down the sharks for 30 seconds <laughs> in complete silence, 
And so everybody is out there and you go out and you stand there and you're just looking at these people. Nobody's talking. And then all of a sudden you hear a voice come over the you know loudspeaker and says, and pitch. And you go right into it. But the first time I was on there, I'm standing there getting ready to pitch. I'm super nervous. Butterflies are crazy. All of a sudden, Barbara looks over to Robert and says, oh my gosh, look at his ears. <laughs> and so all of a sudden, this woman is making fun of my ears because they are a bit Spock-like. And uh, I'm thinking to myself, you got to be kidding me. I'm about to pitch for my life and you're making fun of my ears. Awesome. But, uh, but yeah, so... Just practice, practice, pra- practice, practice, practice. And, and know your stuff for yeah, the questions. absolutely. That's so, the other thing that blows my mind about Shark Tank. People come out there and that you know what questions they're going to ask. Brett, you've never been on, but you know what questions they're going to ask. I know exactly what they're going to ask every <laughs> single time. Exactly. What's their revenue for a month? You know, what's profit? What's this? And like, there's people just like, I blah, don't know. Exactly. Know your numbers. Shark Tank 101. So, so uh, yeah, so any pitch, uh, practice, practice, practice. Visualize. And visualize and then uh, just know your stuff, know your numbers, everything inside and out. Well, hey, Aaron, this has been a, a great conversation. Um, and I, I love, I wish we could continue because there's a lot more we could dig into, but where can people find out more about your work? Yeah, um, my website, IamAlphaM.com, is where all my videos are, or you can just search in YouTube Alpha M, M as in male, and find more than you. <laughs> more, more than you wanted to. Um, I, I talk about pretty much anything. Nothing's off limits. And um, I just have a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, YouTube is, is probably where I'd be most proud if people, people right. went and checked me out there. That's awesome. And he does get into everything. There's some questions that you would... <laughs> You would be surprised he'd be he he'll address it in his YouTube video. But but I do it as diplomatically right. as possible. You, you, know, you do a good job, and you keep so, it fun. Thank you. Thank and you, you keep thank it you. Fun. I'm I'm like blue cheese. At first, you might not like me, but if you watch a few more, I may grow on you a bit. So, <laughs> well, Aaron Marino, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Brett McKay, absolutely, and thank you. My guest today was Aaron Marino. He is a men's style consultant, style expert, and a owner of several businesses. You can check out his amazing style content at imalphaM.com or just go to YouTube and Google IM Alpha or search I am Alpha M. You'll find his stuff. Also check out the show notes at aom.is slash Marino for links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic.